Happy Sabbath to everyone this evening. I want to welcome you to what I calculate is our 17th graduation service at Washtenaw Hills College. And um, that is uh, a real blessing. To, we can have a graduation service. We weren't sure with the academy we were going to, but um, I am so thankful that uh, each of you have been able to come to help celebrate this special time for our college graduates. And we hope that uh, you are, are blessed. Um, as I was thinking today, I believe that um, the devil is mad. Amen. The devil and his army. But uh, we serve a victorious captain. And we're in another army. And... Uh, I remember a song we used to sing when our kids were young, the devil is mad and I am glad. And so even though we know there's some awesome, serious and sober times facing our world, yet uh, it's exciting to know that uh, Jesus is coming soon. We want to also welcome our special speaker this evening, Pastor George Bauté. He was on our staff here for, I think, six years, wasn't it, Pastor Baute? Five. Five years. But uh, we were so delighted to have his ministry here on our campus and sad when he left. But he's now pastoring in, uh, back in North Carolina, actually, two little churches in the Hendersonville area, Upward Church and the Fairview Churches. And I know that God is going to speak through him to each of our hearts this weekend and uh, we're so glad that he can be with us i'm wondering if um, well don't think we're to take time for praise and prayer tonight is that right magda yes or no yes, yes. oh okay good i wasn't sure if that was <clears throat> factored into the time or not all right, let's uh, hear what you are happy and uh, thankful for this evening as the Sabbath will beginning, be beginning. Um, who would like to uh, have a praise? Yes. Okay, okay. No mics? That's fine. So, um, the Lord ministers to our family in really unique ways. So, I also think there's a little bit of humor in this story. And um, my parents, they're building a new, they're building a new house, and they just got to start putting appliances in it. And strange enough, their fridge and their oven all have a Sabbath mode on it, where they cannot heat up, or like actually bake anything in the oven every seventh day of the week. Sabbath. They can only warm things up, and they, I thought that was really unique. I've never heard of anything like that. <laughs> but I think God's getting the point across with just common kitchen appliances. So I praise Him for that. Must, must have been an environmentalist that designed that. Huh? <laughs> it's not on Sunday, though, so I mean. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Very interesting. <clears throat> Who else has a praise? And... All right, Brother Matthew. God for Jesus and his son who or Jesus is his son who died for me. I'm thankful for that, or else I'd be a lost man. And I've I've been lost and I don't like it. And Jesus, the fact that he saved my life from sin is such a blessing. Amen. And I praise God for Jesus. Amen. It is a blessed opportunity to come and congregate and be around Watch the Hills family. And I'm so happy for all the graduates being here for another weekend. And I just praise God for the fellowship. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm just so grateful that my, my son was a lost man. And I prayed. I fell on my face before the Lord. I said, I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. And the answer that I always got back was 
Just keep loving him. Just keep showing him my love. Because in the end, that's the only thing that's going to touch their hearts, right? Is love. If, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. And um, I don't know, did the Lord just put everything into place? We, we came out for Reuben's graduation, and <sighs> thank you so much, Chris, for inviting uh, Matt to go canvassing. And um, the Lord just put everything into place, and it changed his life. And instead of killing himself by, you know, inches, now he's graduating. He's married to just, just a wonderful, beautiful woman, and, and, and he's, he's been redeemed yeah. by the blood of the Lamb. And I just, I couldn't, do, I couldn't do this for him, but God did it. And I just want to thank God so much. For, he, he gave us our son back. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Never underestimate the prayer of a mother. How many of us are praying for a wayward child? I'm very thankful because um, for everything that Washita Hills has um, taught me and shared with me, and I know that um, this is a special place. And today I'm very thankful because my family was able to come. They haven't been able to come to school because they live, we live so far away. But finally they made it, and that is very special. So I praise God because he kept them safe on the road, and um, they're finally here. And yes, I praise God for what he's doing in our lives and for the opportunity to um, be able to um, worship God together <laughs> and at the same time. Um, tomorrow I decided to... Um, give my life to God again, surrender my entire life to Him. And that's the reason why I've been waiting so long, because I really wanted my family to be here. And so I'm <laughs> so thankful for that. So, yes. Amen. More answered prayers. All right, do we have some prayer requests this evening? I'm thankful for this graduation. Praise God for it and that His presence is here. I actually talked to an individual um, Eddie Sanchez, uh, many of you know him, and uh, I believe he's getting out of the hospital today. He was in with COVID, and uh, so he requested prayer. He asked that his name be mentioned, and so I want to lift Eddie Sanchez. Well, let's go to our knees and seek the Lord in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, it is uh, indeed a joy to welcome the Sabbath, your special day and special hours. It is a joy to uh, gather here on this weekend to celebrate the accomplishments of a senior class at Washtuck Hills College. We're thankful for the way you've worked in each of their lives. We know that each of them have a story. We thank you for rescuing our young people from uh, bad decisions and a path toward destruction. We know that we would all be on that path except for the saving grace of Jesus. And many of us had prayers of our mothers and, and others who prayed for us. I think of a lady that every day prayed for me for many years. <clears throat> and I know that... Uh, Satan is anxious to deceive the very elect, if possible, but we're thankful that Jesus lives and he is sitting on the throne next to the Father and interceding for us. I pray that we might um, experience his presence and his peace, his joy this weekend, and I pray that you'll bless each of these young people as they go out to serve you, that um, they might hasten your coming and bring many to a knowledge of Jesus. This evening we're in a world in turmoil 
and it seems to be getting worse every week. And we know that uh, the angels are having a struggle holding back the winds of strife. And we pray that uh, we might be faithful in doing our part in, in warning those around us of what is coming. <clears throat> I pray for those who are sick and uh, struggling, especially many with COVID. I pray that you will bless Eddie Sanchez in a special way, give him complete recovery, we pray. We pray also for Deborah Knopchek, and I pray for others who um, have not been mentioned, but you know them, and we pray that um, <clears throat> the experiences that many of them are going through might turn their hearts to you, because uh, this life is meaningless compared to the future immortal life. Now we ask a special measure of your Holy Spirit to fill us and to use us, make our hearts ready for the message that Pastor Bauté will share this evening. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Glad each one of you are here and those that are watching online. Um, before we sing, I just wanted to read actually the verses that we chose as a class. Um, it's on the front of your program. You can read along with me just for a moment. This comes from Ephesians 3, 16 through 20. And it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in the hearts in your hearts by faith, that ye may be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and the depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And now unto him that is able to exceedingly, sorry, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Now our song is titled, Bow the Knee. And I was, as I was thinking the connection between this verse, or these verses and our song, I see a few different things here. So in, in verse 16, it says, to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. And then in the next verse, it says, being rooted and grounded in love. And then later on, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The only reason or the only way that any of these things can happen is if we are spending time on our knees, spending time on our knees, talking to the Lord. And so this, this, uh, this song is a beautiful, kind of like a prayer. It's, it's, it's basically sharing that there's difficulties that come in life. There's things that come. There's joys. There's fears. There's all different type of things. But most of all, we need to be spending time on our knees. Time on our knees. So may you be blessed. There are moments on our journey following the Lord when God illumines every step we take. There are times when circumstances make perfect sense to us as we try to understand each move He makes. But when the path grows dim, and our questions have no answers, turn to Him. Bow the knee, trust the heart of your Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. of his plan in the presence of your king bow the knee there are days when clouds surround us the rain begins to fall and the cold and lonely winds won't cease to blow and there seems to be no reason for the 
suffering we feel we are tempted to believe God doesn't know when the storms arise don't forget we live by faith and not by sight bow the knee Trust the heart of your Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. And when you don't understand the purpose of his plan, the presence of your King, bow the Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It is good to see you. I'm already here and I'm disrupting things. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But I need to see my laptop here. <clears throat> but uh, it is a blessing to be back uh, on this campus. You know, uh, you, you learn things here you, you can't learn anywhere else. I'm, I'm just telling you right now. Uh, this school is a blessing and is playing a very critical role in these closing moments of Earth's history. I want to um, uh, just uh, send a greetings from my family. So Ellen uh, right now is with my, our daughter Sarah, who is going to be an assistant girls dean in uh, Blue Mountain Academy. And while they were heading north, I was heading west. And, uh, and then our son Joshua is an outstanding uh, bicycle mechanic in Cleveland, Tennessee, very proud of him. And, uh, and so I know that they would like to have been here if they could have been. You know, <clears throat> there's so much that, uh, that I would love to share with you. We're going to touch a little bit on some things tonight and then flesh out a, a little bit more in the next couple days. But uh, my friends, we, we have entered into the final storm in this world's history. And it is vital for us as a people to recognize that. Uh, we play a very unique role in, in, in ushering in the coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, I'll touch a little bit more on that. But, but this campus has played uh, in a very important role. And I feel God has used this campus in many ways in getting us here. But I, I really believe with all my heart that it's going to play an even bigger role here in the closing moments. I, you know, <clears throat> we were told that the final movements would be rapid. We just never really stopped to think about what rapid looked like. And uh, we're learning. Um, I do have some thoughts I'd like to share uh, with you uh, this evening. And um, I would like uh, to begin with a word of prayer. If you'll bow your heads, um, I would like to, to kneel. Father in heaven, I, I want to thank you for the privilege of being here this evening. Uh, Lord, uh, it is just evident to me that you orchestrated this. And so, Father, our eyes are to you um, in a special way this weekend because we really want to hear a word from you. Lord, we're reminded that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, so we request the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And I, I pray that especially for me. Uh, I need, Lord, your mind to be given to me. You know there are things that I'll be talking about, Father, 
that I but barely understand, and I truly need the insight that I may be the conduit by which you communicate your mind to us tonight. Uh, Lord, we, we want to see Jesus, and uh, I pray you'll give us that ISAB that you promised, and uh, so for that we give you thanks. And so, Lord, please glorify your name this evening. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as I get going here, I first of all want to thank the class of 2020 for the invitation. And uh, as I call your names, I'd like to know where you are. Even though you have masks, it's not going to help me. But, okay, Matthew, all right. I appreciated your testimony, brother. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so, so, all right, good to have you here with us as well. Thank you for having me here. And then Nathan, I know brother Nathan. Uh, Michelle, I know Michelle. There she is, right there with the whole family. All right. Annette. Annette. It was good hearing your testimony as well. Adriana. She's not here yet, okay. And Maria. Maria, mucho gusto. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your kind invite. Um, <clears throat> the text that you selected uh, this evening, Ephesians 3, 16 through 20, uh, has been a joy for me to study in preparation for this presentation tonight. Um, but if you will permit me, I'm going to expand it a little bit uh, from uh, verses 14 to 21, because I, I believe that just gives us a little bit more uh, of, a, of a holistic picture of what Paul is trying to communicate uh, to us. And if you'll forgive me, I'm just going to dive right in. We're going to we're going to do this more as a classroom. You okay with that? <laughs> of course you are. Here it's cool. So we're going we're gonna to take that approach. Uh, before we, we do dive in, though, I'd like to give a little bit of a background to the book of what motivated uh, Paul to write this, what was he aiming for. And uh, what we learn is that uh, Paul wrote the book of Ephesus at the end of his second missionary journey. Paul was a missionary. You know, anyone that has an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and gives his life to him, becomes a missionary. Isn't that true? I mean, we all want to be saved. Isn't that true? But doesn't don't other people want to be as well? Hello? They do. I'm glad somebody knocked at my door. And so God wants us to do that for others. And Paul was so grateful for what Jesus had done for him that it, it was demonstrated in his life. It wasn't lip service with Paul. But anyway, on his second missionary journey, and of all things, uh, at a time in when he was imprisoned. Um, so during uh, this time, he, uh, prior, obviously, to being imprisoned, he visits the, the city of Ephesus. Uh, and at the time, it was a very prominent and strategic city located in what the Romans called Asia Minor. Uh, this city was actually the religious center of pagan worship. And I love the fact that Paul goes after that city, the center of pagan worship. Paul was a believer in maximizing your impact. He, he figured out where the devil's headquarters was, and he went over there and stuck the banner of Jesus Christ right in the middle of it. Paul had starch. He had courage. And uh, many of you will recall that there was a temple, that very famous temple in Ephesus. Anybody remember the name? The Temple of? Diana. Diana. Very good. And uh, this is an artist's rendition of what it must have looked like. It was really a massive structure. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. And this is a model, a mock model of it. And I just don't understand how these people that didn't have modern equipment could build something so colossal. Uh, is really quite impressive. Well, the letter that Paul writes to the Ephesians in this city uh, focused on the believer's responsibility to walk in harmony with and consistently with the heavenly calling that Jesus has played upon them. That's not unique to this, their, just their day, isn't that right? Paul wrote this letter to help the believers there to be more aware of their identity in Jesus and to motivate them to take advantage of all the resources that heaven has provided them in living for Jesus. Don't, don't miss this. Paul builds. 
So what does Paul do uh, to remind them? Well, <clears throat> first of all, we have to remember that the, the Ephesian believers were poor. They were poor people, poor in earthly things, but they were rich in Jesus Christ. The problem is they really weren't aware of how rich they were. So Paul sets out to remind them. And so in, in chapters 1 through 3, uh, Paul here is, is listing uh, all that is theirs in the bank account of heaven. First of all, they're adopted into the family of God. Secondly, uh, of their acceptance with God the Father. He, he talks to them about their redemption through Jesus Christ, of their forgiveness through Jesus' sacrifice, of the wisdom that is promised of God, of their eternal inheritance that awaits them, of the promised seal of the Holy Spirit, of the empowered life through the Holy Spirit, of the power of God's grace, and of their citizenship in heaven. Were they rich? Yeah, they were. So Paul reminds them of all the blessings that is theirs because of the cross of Jesus Christ. The treasury of heaven is open and available to them so that they can live for God. Is that good news? You know, I don't think that we spend enough time really thinking about the risk that heaven took to save us. You know, Sister White says that Jesus risked eternal loss. Did you ever, how many have ever seen that quote? What in the world does that mean? Would he have remained under the power of the prince of darkness? Was the throne of heaven placed at risk? And yet he didn't bat an eyelash when you and I fell. God took an incredible risk and then opens the windows of heaven for you and I. Do we think about this? Do we pause? We need to. Well, this is what Paul's doing. He's trying to get them to think about that. Now, in chapters 4 through 6, we find here an explanation of, of the spiritual walk. And so Paul is, teaches the new believer how to walk a walk that is grounded in that wealth that God has provided for them in Jesus Christ. Now, uh, we already read Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. If you'll forgive me, we're going to do it again. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to read through it real quick, and then, uh, then we're going to just kind of start breaking it down. So Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 says, for this reason, and by the way, if you really want to have some fun with this, get different translations and paraphrases and just work these texts. This is a really powerful you know, um, pastors are usually, <laughs> pastors are really busy, and I have been super busy. COVID and all this other crazy stuff that's going on right now has just had me on roller skates. And trying to find time to put this together, you know, it's just really easy to reach for something you've done in the past, right? The answer is yes. And, um, <clears throat> and so, uh, uh, Miss Marty shared with me the text, and I looked them over and started reading them, and I said, you know what, I, I'm going to have to work with this. This is, this is too good to pass up. And, um, and so let's, let's do that, and then we're going to unpack it. Uh, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might, through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the height, uh, the depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory uh, in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So what is Paul trying to communicate here? Well, let's begin unpacking verse 14 first. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There's really a lot that's packed right here. I appreciated the special song, the special music. Bow the knee. That's what Paul is talking about here, bowing the knee. And that's what we do when we, when we come to worship God. Isn't that true? We bow the knee. <clears throat> Bending the knee is a sign of submission to God. It's, it's actually a, a visible uh, dis, uh, display of our acknowledgement of our need for him. Did you know that? It's acknowledging his greatness and my dependence upon him. And, th- and that's why anytime we can, we go to worship him, we need to bend the knee. Isn't that right? Uh, but the thing is, is that this is what the angels do as well. Stop and think about that. The angels do that as well. So, so Paul is drawing our attention to the unity that exists between the family of heaven and the family of earth when the heart is filled with love for Jesus Christ. We're united as a family. Jesus is the great center. Our love and gratitude is to him, and that unites the families of heaven and the family of earth. It is that love, that adoration and worship that unites us. That's why it's so important, my friends, that our worship on earth has to resemble the worship in heaven. You know, you realize that when we get to heaven, there's not going to be, oh, uh, your style is in that room. Wait, your style is in that room. There's only one. Does that make sense? And this unites us. That worship unites us, and it's, it's centered on true love and adoration for God. By the way, I don't know about you, but uh, I actually, uh, even though I, I, you know, I come from a Hispanic background, I really don't have a big family. My wife has an even smaller family, but because of Jesus Christ, I have a huge family. Isn't that awesome? So if you have chosen Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, dear friend, you are part of the family of God. And I look forward one day to that final feast, final, as far as it relates to the great controversy, to that day we go to Jesus' house to have that feast together at his home. That could be awesome. And we're told he's gonna serve us there. Well, <clears throat> I love the fact that John, the apostle, brings this out as well. In 1 John 3, 2, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God. Isn't that awesome? And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Is that something to look forward to? It is. So Paul starts right off uh, this portion of his letter by reminding us that because of the cross of Christ, we are now all part of the family of God, a family that is very much interested, by the way, in your salvation and mine. Let's take a look now in verse 16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. And so here again, Paul is is letting us know that because of the gift of God's son, of the uh, limitless resources that are available to us. And the greatest source, the greatest gift, apart from Christ, right behind Christ is what? Is the Holy Spirit. So here, we find that Paul is not satisfied with Christians living a nominal life. Paul wants all believers to have the fullness of the grace that is offered us by God. Paul wants the Christian to plunge the depths and scale the heights of spiritual life and power that God offers us. So Paul wrote that he wants God's children to be strengthened with what? With might. And this might that Paul refers to here is the power of God that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something, friend, without it, we're finished. You know that God is not interested in your righteousness? I have bad news for you. There's only one righteousness he's interested in, and it's the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. He's not interested in yours. He's interested in his, and he'll work it in us. That's what we got to be listening to here. The power that converts a sinner must continue to work in the redeemed heart if there's going to be growth. You know, this is something that 
I, I would like to say all Christians, but we Adventists really struggle with. At, at least, let me just speak for me. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, my life was a mess, and um, some of you who were here will remember that uh, I attempted to take my life um, when I was 20, and that's when God broke into my life and I gave him the chance that I didn't give him before. And it was amazing what he did in my life. So thankful what he did. But there was some confusion in my life. I, I needed Jesus to get me started in my Christian walk, but guess whose power I relied upon to continue that walk? And I'm not going to ask for hands here who has struggled the same. So Paul is, is trying to bring to our awareness that not only do we need Jesus to convert us, we need Jesus to transform us continually. Thank you. I heard an enthusiastic amen. I hope there's more by the time we're done. But, but, I, but, I, but the thing is that I'm going to share something with you. As a denomination, the reason why we're still here is because we have not gotten this. You know that every murder that has taken place in the 20th and 21st century is because of us. We shouldn't be here. We're not getting this. And Paul is trying to, this is extremely important. Every crime, we should, we should not have seen World War II, World War I. You're with me. We should have been out of here. Spirit of Prophecy brings this out, by the way. We should have been out because we're not getting this. We need Jesus Christ at every step. Uh, you know, you and I want to have physical strength. We eat wholesome food, right? So if we want spiritual life, we have to not only get connected to Christ, we have to remain there. There's no other way to be transformed. And so Paul continues to flesh this out a little more in the next verse, 17. That Christ may what? Dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in what? In love. The word dwell in this text in the Greek means to inhabit or to abide. So here Paul adds the idea of continuation. In other words, Jesus isn't supposed to be an occasional visitor in the heart and mind, but an abiding daily presence. Now you got quiet. This is good. Because we've got to figure this one out. This is important. In other words, um, an abiding presence. This is what the Lord Jesus was trying to communicate to his disciples that night so long ago before his betrayal. Now remember what his disciples were about to face. And then soon after that, Jesus is going to leave. So his final words have to be the critical words. He's trying to sum up what he's been trying to tell them for three and a half years. So in John 15, 4 through 6, we find this word. Now, everywhere the word abide appears, you're, su you're supposed to say it. Let's practice. One, two, three. Okay, you're with me. Okay, so that's the first word. Ready? In me and I in you. Okay, so now he uses an illustration from nature. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Stop. What did he just say? Did you catch that? Branches cannot produce fruit in themselves. Are we listening? Church. As the branch cannot, it is incapable of bearing fruit in itself unless it, what? Abides in the vine. Now he bridges the illustration to us. Neither can you unless you, what? In me. I am the vine. You're the branches. He who, what? Abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do some things. How much of nothing is nothing? And without me, you can do that much. Zilch. Do we believe that, friends? We're going to have to come to the place we believe it if we're going to see any change in our lives. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. By the way, what's the fruit here talked about that Jesus mentions? Is it 
bananas, oranges. It's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He is saying that the branch cannot produce that fruit on its own. Can't. It has to be connected to the vine. And, and so the key here then becomes the connection. You know, I tell people, I can go to church and call myself a Christian, right? I can also walk into my garage and call myself a car. <laughs> but that doesn't make me a Christian. It uh, doesn't make me a car. Going to church doesn't make me a Christian anymore. Be going into my garage makes me a car. It's the connection. It's what has our focus, my friends. This idea of transformation through the focus is brought out in these two texts, and we're familiar with them. Second uh, Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unfailed face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we're focusing upon Christ, something begins to happen inside of us. And it's not just what we see, it's also what we think about. Proverbs 23, 7, Solomon, the wisest man, said, as a man thinketh in his heart, what happens? <clears throat> I don't know about you, but right about now, we ought to be getting a little nervous. Why are, where is our focus? Paul is, is, is challenging us. So what Paul is reminding the Ephesian believers here, and us too, is that while with repentant, and, uh, repentant hearts and humility, we meditate upon the life of Jesus through his word, little by little, we become more and more conformed into his likeness. Um, Paul is saying that if they do this, they'll become more like Jesus. It is by beholding that they become changed into the divine likeness. But the key here is understanding that just as we need Jesus to become converted, we also need him every day in order to remain converted. Getting connected and remaining connected is the key. Now, in the spirit of prophecy, this idea is brought out over and over. I'm going to show you some very interesting texts um, or quotes. Desire of Ages 676. Abiding in Christ means, what's that word? That's a big word. A constant receiving of his spirit, a life of unreserved surrender to his service. The channel of communication must be open how often? Just in the morning and just in the evening. Is right? What is this? What's that word? Continually between man and his God. As the vine branch constantly draws sap from the living vine, so are we to cling to Jesus and receive him then by faith, the strength and perfection of his, of his own Character. Let's look at the next one, volume 5, uh, Bible Commentary, 1144. A union with Christ by living faith is enduring. Every other union must perish. Christ first chose us, paying an infinite price for our redemption. Let me stop right there. Infinite price for our redemption. <clears throat> How many of you here have pets at home? Mercy, how many of you wish you had a pet at home? Okay, a few more of you. How many of you once had a pet or knew someone that, anyway? <clears throat> so you love your pet, you care for your pet, right? Well, suppose that some disease was going through the pet world and was killing your favorite pets all over the world, your pet. And um, imagine that... Um, your pet rabbit was going to die, and the only way for you to save your pet rabbit was to become a rabbit. Now, there's a catch here. You can never return to being who you were. You must always remain that rabbit. You and I have no idea. I mean, th th what I just shared with you seems ludicrous, but Jesus became a man. The eternal God became a human being forever, paying an infinite price for our redemption. The true believer chooses Christ as first and last and best in how much? 
In what? In everything. Is it up there? But this union costs something. It is a relation of utter dependence to be entered into by proud beings. Does that describe anyone in this room? All who form this union must feel their need of the atoning blood of Christ. See, Laodicea doesn't do that. Laodicea does not feel that. They must have a change of heart. They must submit their own will to the will of God. There will be a struggle with outward and internal obstacles. There must be a painful work. What kind of work is it? Why is it painful? Because self doesn't want to give up. Painful work of detachment as well as the work of attachment, pride, selfishness, vanity, worldliness, sin, in all of its forms must be overcome if we would enter into a union with Christ. The reason why many find the Christian life so deplorably hard, why they are so fickle, so variable, is that they try to attach themselves to Christ without detaching themselves from their cherished idols. Can't have the world in heaven too. We'll lose both. Let's continue. We must learn to look where? Upward. The thoughts must be what? Centered upon God. Who's got time for that? Friends, there's no other way. Are you with me? Testimonies to Ministers 508. The connection with divine agency, how often? Every moment is essential to our progress. We may have had a measure of the Spirit of God, but by prayer and faith we are to continually to seek more of the Spirit. Uh, Steps to Christ, page 69. Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, all depends upon the union with Christ. It is by communion with Him daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we're to grow in grace. If you and Harold, uh, July 9, 1908, we must maintain a what? Constant living connection with Christ. Volume 5, Testimonies 47. The mind must be what? Constantly going after God. You know, we, we Adventists are very sincere, we're educated, we're hardworking, And we are very comfortable making a savior out of activity. We get so busy in the work of God that we forget the God of the work. The mind must be constantly going after God. Pray always. Rely upon him hour by hour and moment by moment. Review and Herald, 1897. There is no place for us to rest in careless attitude. We must never forget the warnings of Christ. Watch unto prayer. Watch and pray always. A connection with the divine agency every moment is essential to our progress. We must have a measure of the, uh, we may have a measure of the Spirit of God, but by prayer and faith, we are continually seeking for more of the Spirit. We will never do to cease our efforts. If we do not, uh, progress. If we do not place ourselves in an attitude to receive both the form of the latter rain, we shall lose our souls and the responsibility will lie on our own doors. You know, it, it's really interesting to me, but since I have been reading this, I have come to understand the whole concept of country living differently. You know, we have a lot of <laughs> sincere Adventists out there who are hiding in the woods, stockpiling their veggie links and guarding it with an AK-47. And just thinking that when the Lord comes, they're going to go, we made it, we had enough veggie links, and they're going to find themselves lost. The purpose to get out there is to commune with God. It's to commune. Now, we're not to stay there. We've got to go into the valley where the people are. Isn't that right? But it's, it's communing with him. And you know, in the city is every possible distraction. When I read about the stuff that she says about the cities in her day, I think, what in the world would she say about ours? Mercy. But all the, de- all the devil has to do to win in our lives is to distract us. The spirit of prophecy is sprinkled throughout with statements like these. Statements that clearly communicate to us the importance of training, educating the mind to focus on Jesus. We need to have our minds focused on the Lord, his teachings from morning to night. 
This is how a living connection is made and maintained. And I'll be honest with you, I'm learning this. You know, <clears throat> I, I believe that the cell phone will be the loss of a lot of good people. That sucks so much time. It just is constantly putting filth in front of us. And I, I, you know, there's a real temptation to look at the news, but I am having to say no. If there's something I need to know God's going to tell me, I don't have to wade through the cesspool to find something good. And the thing is that it, it just plants seeds in the minds, and we begin to carry out one, one line, one liner, or a picture, an image. Boom, it's there. And now the devil starts massaging it. Are you with me? I, I just, I can't, wa I can't look at the news, Kevin. I can't do it. Staying connected is the key. You know, I, don't, I really don't see hardly any writers writing about the connection. I, I, the morning and evening connection, but not the remaining connected. I want to give you one book uh, that is the only guy I've come across that really does flesh this out. His name is Lewis Weir. I, I, apart from the spirit of prophecy, I don't know if there's anybody that shoots as straight as this guy. But Lewis Weir, he was a, a writer, a, 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 a self-made theologian, just immersed spirit of prophecy in the Bible of yesteryear. The book is called Power Unlimited. It's about the message of righteousness by faith and the final crisis. And the only place you're going to find it is Layman's Ministries. Power Unlimited by Lewis Weir. But the key is the connection. Let me show you a few more here. <clears throat> Every individual by his own act enters into a personal union with Christ by self-renunciation, faith, and obedience. We must gain the victory over self, crucifying the affections and lust. Then begins the union of the soul with Christ. After the union is formed, it can be preserved only by continual earnest. What's the next word? Pain second effort. You know what I'm learning? If, you're if we're going to understand and appreciate the message of righteousness by faith, we're going to have to spend some time in the Laodicean message. I, I don't think you got that. If we're going to appreciate, understand the message of righteousness by faith, we're going to have to spend some time with the Laodicean message. You see, nobody goes to see the doctor unless they're convinced they're sick. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. <clears throat> Steps to Christ, page 71. Look to Christ. Let the mind dwell on his love, upon his beauty, the perfection of his character. Subject for the soul's contemplation. When the mind dwells upon self, now this next one is for every sincere Christian that loves Christ and is disappointed with their performance. Listen to what Spirit of Prophecy has to say to you. When the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. Hence, it is Satan's what? Constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ. And uh, I submit to you, I don't know if there's a better way in this generation than the cell phone. Desire of Ages 668. <clears throat> if the eye, I love this, I love this. If the eye is kept fixed on Christ, the work of the Spirit ceases not until the soul is conformed to his image. Isn't that beautiful? Is that hopeful, brothers and sisters? God is not interested in your righteousness. He's interested in his righteousness, that he'll work in you if you'll give him your attention. In chapter 3 of Ephesians, Paul expresses his desire to have Jesus dwell in the hearts and minds of the believer through faith that is rooted and grounded in God's love. Paul actually uses those words, rooted and grounded, and he often uses these words when he wants to make a point and reinforce it. You see, love that is rooted goes down deep into the soil of the heart and pulls in all the faculties of the mind. And love that is grounded is describing the foundation which all of our relationships are based on. In other words, real love is the result of having Jesus Christ reigning in your heart. The rooting not only connects us with God, but it also binds us with one another. It becomes the foundation of every healthy relationship. That is why to marry someone who has not devoted their life to Christ is asking for serious heartache. 
because the only source of true love is Christ. That's it. And if you're not connected to Jesus, then your love is, is earthly. It's cheap. And it has a price. True love comes from Christ. Paul continues uh, in verse 18. I'm going to back up a little bit here in 17 so this flows better. That you may, being, uh, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So Paul wants the believer to understand and experience God's amazing love, which not only impacts the heart of the believer, but all the family of God, all the believers. It's this love that binds us together. It, it, it doesn't matter, my friends, a person's color, their nationality, their race, gender, education, height, weight, whatever. If Christ dwells in your heart, it will connect with Christ who's dwelling in mine. Does that make sense? If the love of Jesus is there and it's in me, we're going to connect. Why? We're a family. You know, we go far back enough, we all have the same mom and dad. When there was an earthquake in Haiti and people died, we lost family. That's why this whole social upheaval that's taking place right now, and I'm watching Adventist March in it, is very alarming to me. First of all, you, we need to do some research as, as to what's behind all that, and it is pure spiritualism. Okay? You know, getting the new, a new president or a new police or, or new laws isn't going to change anything because the problem is not an external problem. It's an internal problem. The only solution to what's happening in our world is the gospel. There is no other solution. It's really interesting. If you have a moment, just read in Desire of Ages, page 509 and 510, and watch Jesus' approach to the political and social abuses of his day. She uses the word aloof. He was aloof to it. Why? Because he knew that protesting wasn't going to change anything. For lasting change, you needed to change a heart. The gospel is the only solution to what we're seeing. My friends, the love of God is something that no human being can completely understand or grasp. It is something that is beyond our comprehension because it is infinite. It is something that can never be exhausted and will forever present to us new fields of discovery and understanding. This love is the source of our growth. Paul wrote that he wanted the believer to experience the fullness of God. In other words, his desires for the believer to have the fullness of Christ's character shining through their life. This is the goal of the plan of salvation that was put into effect the day Adam and Eve fell. This is Paul's goal for all of God's children. What Paul is actually talking about in these verses is the everlasting gospel. This is what Seventh-day Adventists call the message of righteousness by faith. This is the message that when it is given and lived, finishes the work and gets us ready for the second coming of our Lord and Savior. This truth has been lost by the people of God and it must be recovered. God has been trying to get us as a people to understand this. Now I know you have been studying this here in this college and this is one of the unique blessings of coming here because you're not going to be getting it <laughs> in too many other places but i want to do a brief recap with you okay a little history here you ready in eight are you ready thank you in um god raised up two men jones and wagner ej was the first one to understand the message of righteous by faith he was the first one to get the uh-huh in 1881 you take a look at a, at a historical timeline, and, and don't miss this, stay with me. But about the time in 1881 when E.J. gets it, whoa, it it's all depends on Christ, his righteousness. 
It's not my goodness, it's his goodness. It's the power of God in me. My dependence and reliance is fully on him. I can believe him, I can trust him. He risked the universe to save me. The moment he begins to get this, the Sunday law issues begin to agitate in the United States. So, so as E.J. Buchanan continues to grow in his understanding of the message of righteousness by faith, the Sunday law issues continue to increase. We have the big showdown in 1888 when, when Ellen White calls these guys together to bring all the leaders so that they can see it, understand it, love it, embrace it, and spread it so that the end can come, right? That was the idea. Does anyone know what happened in the spring of that year? The Sunday Law Bill by Senator Blair was presented to Congress that same year. By 1892, the, the revival of this message is in full swing within the denomination. By the way, in the face of overwhelming opposition. Okay? Um, now, as this, this revival has taken place within the church, does anyone know historically what's happening in the United States in 1892? The economy is spiraling in 1892. So bad that, that there's talk of turning over the currency. Do you know what that happens if the currency changes in your, in your government? Whatever you have in the piggy bank is useless. Okay. In fact, in 1897, Sister White writes a letter to the church leadership and he says to them, don't, and I'm paraphrasing, this is the Baute paraphrase, don't get caught up in this. Can't you see it's a ploy of the devil to get you off track? Stay focused. Fulfill the mission. I should have brought that. It was a beautiful quote. But in any case, so in 1892, the economy is tanking. The Sunday law battles are, 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 are underway. And Sister White gives this quote. And this quote is so critical. Okay? Watch this quote. I, I should have broken it down, but I was busy uh, trying to get ready here. Okay, the time of test is just upon us. Right? You see that? Okay, so something has happened, something has happened that has signaled to Ellen White that the time of test is upon us. By the way, what is the time of test? It's the National Sunday Law, okay? The time of test is just upon us, she says. Why? Why? Because the, what, why is the time of test? What makes her say that? It's because she sees the Sunday Law? No. Look at she says. For the loud cry, stop. What is the loud cry? Or better yet, what motivates, what empowers the loud cry? Okay, that, okay give me, be specific. Which, the latter rain. So what she's saying here is, okay, for the loud cry, the latter rain power of the message of righteous by faith, the loud cry of the third angel has already what? This was the past. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has begun why? In the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. So that's the Revelation 18. That's the, 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 she's again confirming it's the, the message of, of, of righteousness by faith. What are you saying, Pastor? It's not the Sunday law that brings on the latter rain power. That's not it. It's not the economy crashing. It's the giving and the reception of this message. Do you see it? It's, you and I have a choice in this. It's the giving and receiving of this message that brings on the final crisis. Now watch this. Watch this, volume 6, testimony 70. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other. For what purpose? To prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel, Christ's object lessons 4, 4, 4, 15, 4, 16. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to what? Reveal the grace of Christ, of, of God has done for them. And there's no way to reveal it if we're not connected. And the devil knows it. Sadly, by the beginning of the 20th century, the revival died. 
the latter rain stopped falling. The Sunday laws got quiet and the economy got better. So what does that tell us? It's the giving and receiving of this message, brothers and sisters, that brings on the final crisis. Oh, you aren't getting it. You, you, you have got to see this. Has anybody noticed what's happening to our economy? Does anybody know what's going to happen this fall in the, in the Vatican? Do you know what that's telling me? That the message is going. And either we join it or it's going to pass us by. You see, it's really interesting. I'm reading a book right now by Taylor Bunch called The Exodus and the Advent Movement. Anybody here read that? Oh, you have got to read this book. It starts out a little slow. Hang on. But um, he really does an amazing job of paralleling the history of Israel leaving Egypt, Egypt with the history of the Adventist church. The Advent, you know, remember they arrived at Canaan the first time? And then they had the Kadesh Barnea experience because lack of faith, they didn't enter in. That paralleled uh, Minneapolis 1888. By the lack of faith, they didn't enter in. But the second time when they, when they approached uh, uh, the promised land, where did they stop? No, no. Oh, yeah, this, there was a the little stop. But there was a place they stopped for a while before they, just before they crossed. It was Baal Peor. And it was in Baal Peor when the children of the people of God mingled with the heathen nations and new worship styles began to come in. New music began to come in. Then they got entangled with women. I won't say anything about the women's ordination issue. Are, are, are you with me? And, and so that's where we are. What's happening in the world right now should be a signal to us that the final crisis is right before us now. My friends, the message is going out. People are recognizing they need Jesus for everything. And they're spending time with him. No excuses. And if you have something in your life that's keeping you from Jesus, either you jettison it or you're going to lose your soul. But we're almost home, my young friends. We're almost home home. Well, let's continue with Paul's letter here. For here we find that he is presenting to us the amazing possibilities of growth available to every repentant sinner. You see, your past really doesn't matter if it's hidden Christ. I don't care how squeaky clean it is or how bad it is. If your life is not hidden Christ, you're finished. I am so thankful for the story of Manasseh. He was Israel's version of Hitler. He had the great prophet Isaiah sawn in half. He shed more innocent blood than anybody before him. This guy, this guy led Israel into such a state of apostasy that there was no recovery. They had to go into Babylon. And yet when he asked God for forgiveness... God forgave him. Do we serve an amazing God? My friends, it's through the cross that the human family is once again capable of development through the great privilege of being a partaker of Christ's divine nature. And that's what Paul, that's what Peter talked about here. To me, it's so beautiful. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? How is grace and peace multiplied to you? In the knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow. These Bible promises are for every single man and woman in this pitiful, broken world. God's holy Bible was given to us for the purpose of leading us to an ever-growing understanding of the mind of God so that the void in our lives could be filled with spiritual power. And the amazing thing is, how many of you ever gotten a piece of bread, stuck it in your mouth, and didn't have any jelly or anything on it, no, no butter? How many of you done that? You know, it's, how, how, does it, how is it at first? It's dry. And after chewing on it a while, what happens? It gets, what is it? 
it, it gets chewy, and what happens to it? Come on, y'all haven't eaten bread. What happened? It gets sticky. Y'all need to find some bread. <laughs> Let me tell you what happens. It becomes sweet. Jesus is the bread of life. And for the carnal heart at first, it's dry. Stay with it. It'll become sweet to you as you stay with him. You see, since in Jesus dwells the fullness of God, my friends, then when we open the heart's door to him by believing and yielding our lives to be guided by him, the divine fullness of God comes to man by way of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? That's mind-blowing. Number 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly above, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So now Paul sums everything up with those amazing words. He wants to end by encouraging the believer that what God has promised to do, he can pull it off. Paul is reminding us that there is an amazing abundance of God's love and grace for every person. Love for all. Do you know what all means in the Greek? You know what it means? It means all. My friends, God has resources of spiritual power, power available for you beyond your wildest imaginations. It's not about your weakness. It's about his power. And we need to tap into it. Verse 21. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. My friends, Paul is reminding us that to God alone belongs all the credit. Recognition, honor for the saving work of grace. There is no room to boast. One day, you know, this, this, obviously this scenario isn't going to play out, but you'll get the idea. If we come up to the, to the, to the gates and, a, and the angel asks, why should you come in? And you whip out your list, you're not coming in. The only answer is, I have no business in there except for the blood of Jesus Christ. When the, Jesus says that when we do what we're told to do, we need to consider ourselves what? Unprofitable, Unprofitable servants. That's why if we ever find ourselves condemning someone else or judging, you know, when I mean judging, I mean their motives, right? Because if somebody sins and calling it sin is not judging. Why they sin is judging. But if we find ourselves condemning someone else or looking down on someone else, we have lost sight of Christ. Because if not for the grace of Christ, there go I. Isn't that true? Is that true? All right. My friends, this letter is relevant to you and I. It is this message that prepares the human family to join the heavenly family. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been called to present it to the world. My friends, Jesus will return, and when he does, he'll be coming for a group of people who not only believe this message and yield it to it, but they shared it with others. Is that your desire? Do you, do you understand that it is in, in receiving, in yielding this, to this message, in giving this message, that the power of God is poured out? Do you reckon, do you, did you see that? My friend, the evidence all around us is telling us that the sprinkling of the latter rain has begun. According to the quote we just read in the Spirit of Prophecy, it is that that brings on the final crisis. When the Sunday law hits, the message will have an effect on the world that it would not have had otherwise. What does that mean? That as the church begins to share it, more rain begins to fall. As the non-believers begin to receive it, more rain begins to fall. As they begin to share it with others. Are you following? That's why it intensifies after the Sunday law. And by the way, I came across an interesting quote where Sister White says that as the church sees the non-believers running with it, it will inspire them. My friends, do you want to be part of that? Amen. If you do, raise your hands. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for giving us so much information in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Lord, this campus has played such an amazing role in getting this word out. Not, not just sharing doctrine, but Lord, revealing in the lives of the students 
the power of God, what it looks like when we connect with you. Thank you for this campus being so far away from everything that we have the opportunity, if we choose it and want it, to spend quiet connection time with you in our classes, in our worships, in our friendships. Father in heaven, help us to be faithful. You saw our hands. You know our promises are ropes of sand. Lord, our only hope is to stay focused on you. Teach us day by day how to do that and what it is that's distracting us from you. We thank you for this as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 311. And please stand. Would be like Jesus, nothing in this world enthralled me. I would be like Jesus, be like Jesus, this my song. In the home and in the throne, be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. He has broken every fetter. I would be like Jesus, that the soul may serve him better. I would be like Jesus, be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng, be like Jesus all day long, I would be like Jesus, all the way from earth to glory, I would be like Jesus, telling o'er and o'er the story. I would be like Jesus, be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng, be like Jesus all day long, I would be like Jesus. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, what a oh, beautiful message, looking at those, that prayer of Paul's there in Ephesians. And Lord, I, I especially lift up the graduating class to you right now, and the rest of us too, but especially them, uh, to be dedicated in life and ministry to receiving fully, practically, personally, that message of righteousness by faith, and then sharing it with the world and see that these last movements will happen rapidly as your spirit is coming and pour, being poured out on this planet of those who are looking wistfully to heaven. So Lord, bless each one, and we dedicate this group of graduates to you for this purpose. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are so pleased you could join us for this special event here at Watchtower Hills Academy and College. And if you have enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you'd like to support the making of this program, you can find the donation information on the link below. Thank you so much for joining us, and may God richly bless you.